cosmos, the creator and cosmos. And that's probably one of the reasons I wanted to name this show as Cosmos to Christmas. And the other book that uh, I would like to recommend is Improbable Planet, in which he talks about the Earth being the only place where we can live and, and in the imp improbability of any other place where we, we can go. Um, so, uh, so without wasting any further time, welcome Dr. Ross to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and participating, though it's very early in the morning for you there in, in California. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, thank you. So, um, so to, just, to, just to begin with, um, have you always been a Christian or, uh, or, or you, you went through a journey and then became a Christian? Yeah, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get to know Christians well until I came to Caltech for my postdoctoral research. However, I got very interested in astronomy when I was seven years of age and was reading about four or five books on physics and astronomy a week. And when I was 16, I studied cosmology, uh, the study of the origin, history of the universe. And that's when I realized the universe had a beginning. And if it's got a beginning, there must be a beginner. So starting at age 17, I went on a quest to find that cosmic beginner. And the first place I looked was in the writings of the great philosophers, especially Immanuel Kant and Rene Descartes, mm -hmm. and discovered they didn't have things quite right. And uh, that's when I began to go to the world's holy books. Mm. And uh, I looked at uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, I looked at uh, Islam, uh, Zoroastrianism, and uh, finally I picked up a Bible. And when I tell people I didn't really get to know Christians until I showed up at Caltech, I did get to see two Christians from 30 feet away when I was 11 years old. These were two businessmen that came into our public school and made available to all of us Gideon Bibles. Mm. So at age 17, I started reading that Gideon Bible. And after 18 months, I realized that this Gideon Bible not only was free of scientific and historical errors, it actually predicted uh, future historical events and future scientific discoveries. Things like uh, getting all the order of events and creation correct, mm -hmm. uh, that had actually predicted Big Bang cosmology. And so it was at age 19 that I signed my name in the back of the Gideon Bible, committing my life to Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah, that's quite a journey, but, but you said when you read or when you studied cosmos, that's when you realized that since, since there is a beginning to the cosmos, there must be a creator. And you, you right. from there, your jump is to the religious books. Why? Why religious books? When you started your journey with science and reading Cosmos, what led you to religious books? Well, I actually started with the philosophical books because I was aware that Immanuel Kant, for example, is considered to be the father of cosmology. Hmm. So I read his critique of pure reason. I read some of his other books. Realized he didn't quite have the cosmological uh, you know, description correct. And uh, I went to a public school in Vancouver that was filled from, with refugees from all over the world. And they were encouraging me to read their different holy books. So uh, I read through the Buddhist commentaries, uh, the Hindu Vedas, the Quran, uh, other texts uh, from the Middle East. And uh, finally, I picked up a Bible and mm. began to go through that. Well, this program is aired um, in India, as you obviously know, and I will come to that question a little later about Vedas and Upanishads, what, what you know, the consciousness uh, alone that exists and stuff like that at a later stage uh, in this uh, interview. But let me, let me uh, ask another question on the same lines. You said uh, the, the, the study of cosmos or, you know, compelled you to believe that there is a creator. And uh, is that the same uh, idea, or is it, does that idea is believed in almost all the scientists? Or you're special, you just wanted to believe this, that's the reason you chose the rest of them. I mean, we, we have a lot of um, interaction with scientific society here in India as well, and they, they say, well, you know, they just keep that. What do you say? Well, when I was in my late teens, there was a number of different cosmological models, the steady state model, the oscillating model, the hesitating model, and the Big Bang model. Mm -hmm. But even back then, uh, the observational evidence was heavily, heavily favoring 
the Big Bang uh, creation model. And so I, I looked at that evidence. Uh, I read the research papers. I've, I've been reading research papers since I was 16 and realized it really does seem like it's Big Bang cosmology. And this Big Bang cosmology, there's a beginning to the universe. There must be an agent outside of space and time that created it. That was also the beginning of the development of the space-time theorems. At that time, physicists in Britain and South Africa uh, were developing the first of these space-time theorems. And that theorem basically says if the universe contains mass and a general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe, there must be beginning, not only to the universe, but even to space and time. Mm. And when I picked up the Bible, it actually declared uh, that God created space and time mm. and uh, declared that the universe is expanding, that it has a space-time beginning, uh, that the laws of physics don't change, or one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Mm. And I had enough physics background at the time to realize that all those things are true, the universe must get colder and colder in a highly predictable way, exactly as Big Bang cosmology uh, would, would, would predict. Mm. Okay, so um, so you you quite often talk about um, even even in in this last ten minutes you talked about you you saved the Bible for the last and you read it and finally you realize what can be the actual cause of this cosmos or cause cause of the nature and uh, what are those specific texts that led you to to that belief? Well, there's multiple places in the Bible that talks about the beginning of the universe. I mean, Genesis 1-1, the very first sentence, uh -huh. in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 11-3, that the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. And passages in Timothy and Titus that tell us that God was beginning his works of redemption before he created anything at all, before the beginning of time. So there it actually explicitly speaks about how time has a beginning and how God is the creator of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's multiple passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah where it says that God stretches out or expands the universe. Mm. And uh, I realized that it's in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means it literally is de describing the continual expansion of the universe uh, from a cosmic creation event. And, uh, and then Jeremiah 33, and Romans 8 tells us that the laws of physics don't change. Uh, and one of those laws, according to the book of Romans, is a pervasive law of decay, what we call the second law of thermodynamics. And in thermodynamics, any system that expands gets colder and colder in proportion to the expansion. And so that actually yields you a vividly predicted cooling curve. And today, astronomers have 14 distinct measurements Mm -hmm. of the past temperature of the universe. Mm. Looks like Dr. Ross, um, the connectivity from your side is a little weak. Can you hear me? Dr. How's that Ross? now? That's, that's fine now. Yeah, let's continue. You were at um, God expanding the universe after, after he created it. Uh, you were talking about Jeremiah uh, and Romans. Uh, you were quoting from um, the Romans and also talking about law of thermodynamics, etc. And that's where that's where we lost you for a couple of seconds. Yes, uh, basically saying that uh, uh, the Bible tells us that thermodynamics it calls it the law of decay, and how this law of decay pervades the entirety of the universe. And uh, with under constant laws of physics, thermodynamics tells us any system that expands mm. will cool down in proportion to the rate of expansion. Mm. I was also really impressed uh, that when you look at, say, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it describes the events of the history of the universe and the Earth and the history of life on planet. Everything's in the correct order and everything is correctly described. And I recognize that was way beyond the science of the authors at that time. Mm, mm. So, so you call that as the predictions or actual um, uh, actual records of how, how God did it, or it is big, though they were not scientifically equipped, God revealed that information to them. How do you see it? 
Well, I found over a hundred places in the Bible where it accurately predicted future scientific discoveries thousands of years in advance of the time the authors wrote those. And that's what helped persuade me. This message must come from the one mm. that actually created the universe. Mm. Everything is correct. Mm. So, so when you say everything is correct, Bible says it is actually, you know, six literal days that he created yes. the universe in. And uh, I happened to, you know, watch a couple of debates that you participated and presentations that you did. Uh, but you seem not agreeing with uh, the day factor of that creation. Can you explain a little bit on, on that? Well, even at age 17, I realized this word day in Genesis 1 must have at least three distinct literal definitions because mm -hmm. three are used in the text. On creation day one, it uses the word day for the daylight hours. On creation day four, it uses the word day for a 24-hour period. But in Genesis 2-4, it uses the same word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. Mm. So that's day is a long period of time. And I notice that each creation day is described by an evening and a morning. Each one is ending with that evening morning phrase. And I wasn't aware of what evening morning meant in the original Hebrew, but I knew that at a minimum, it was telling me each creation day had a definite start time and a definite end time. And I expected to find an evening morning phrase for the seventh day, but it's not in the text. Mm. There is no evening morning phrase, which indicates we're still in God's seventh day, which is exactly what Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 tell us, that we're still in God's seventh day. Mm. And when I saw that at 817, it answered for me the fossil record enigma, why we see before humanity the appearance of new orders, new classes, uh, new phyla. Uh, but after the human era, uh, we see hardly any speciation and certainly nothing more generic than the new genera appearing. And I, I looked at the text and said, this makes sense. For six days, God creates that explains all this activity in bringing new species of life to, into being and why we don't see it today. God is at rest. For six days he creates, on the seventh day he's resting, and we're still in that rest day. So even from the first time I picked up the Bible, I realized the creation days in Genesis 1 must be six consecutive long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you think the seventh or the day of rest for God, the seventh, is not, I mean, that day is not used by, uh, uh, not used in terms of a starting uh, time and an ending time. Because of that, you well, think that the last day is still continuing, right? That's correct. We're still in God's seventh day, and that's why we don't see, mm. uh, you know, any dramatic new appearances of life. We see life adapting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're not seeing any radically new species of life appearing on the face of the earth. God has ceased from his work of creating. He's focusing on his work of redemption. Mm. Let me ask one last question in this section and move, move further to what, who that creator can be, because all the religious books claim that, you know, that creator is this God in this particular book. But you said from Bible, you figured out that this creator can only be the God of the Bible. So let me go there. Before before we go there, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, you said, uh, you know, all these texts are talking about um, the the last day, and and we are still continuing. and And the reason for that is there is no new life or new creation that's happening. But what about the death? The death. Uh, I mean, based on uh, based on Fuzz's book, in, there are the reasons to believe. Uh, you know, uh, resource person, first book, uh, who is Adam, he and you in your videos as well, you talk about that the presence of death even before Adam was created. Is How is that possible? Because the book, um, I mean, the Bible talks about the death is the consequence of Adam's sin, isn't it? Yes, but it says death through sin because of Adam's offense was visited upon all people. It says all people, it does not say all life. And when it says death through sin, there's only one species of life on planet Earth that can experience sin, 
and that's as human beings. Mm. So Romans 5 is telling us there was no human death until Adam sinned. Mm. It's silent on the death of plants and animals and microbes. And after all, in the Garden of Eden, uh, you've got Adam and Eve eating, the other animals are eating, therefore things are dying. Mm. And it's thanks for all the death of plants and animals previous to Adam and Eve that we human beings have all the bio deposits, the coal, oil, natural gas, limestone, marble, that we need to launch and sustain civilization. Mm. And with that civilization, bring the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to all the people and groups in the world. You know, that great commission would mm. not be possible unless we had 76 quadrillion tons of bio deposits in the crust of the earth. For, for how much of time, you think? Well, in order to accumulate 76 plus quadrillion tons, you would need at least a billion years of plants and animals and microbes living and dying on the face of the earth. Mm. So, so, so you are again, I mean, that's again, um, is a question there that, uh, you know, there is a, uh, there is a phenomenon that a lot of people, including people from scientific background are talking that earth is only 6,000 years old. Is there, I mean, do you agree with that? If, if Earth is at least a billion years old, how can we reconcile that with uh, the 6,000-year-old theory? Well, the 6,000-year-old theory is based on the mistaken view that the days in Genesis 1 are only 24 hours long and that there's no gaps in the Genesis 5 and 11 genealogies. And again, even before I learned anything about biblical Hebrew, I realize these days must be long periods of time mm. and there must be gaps in the biblical genealogies uh, because the genealogies always drop names. I mean, for example, there's a name in the book of Luke that doesn't show up in Genesis 5. Uh, so, and I realize it's basically naming key patriarchs. Mm -hmm. It's not giving us a complete list. But I think the most important point is there's clear biblical evidence that the creation days are not 24-hour periods. They must be long periods of time. God gave us 66 books. Mm. And addressing these issues, you need to read all 66 books, not just a passage in one book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what, what other books of the 66 books give us this information that it is not just 6,000 years? Well, for example, when you go to Genesis chapter 2, mm -hmm. uh, it tells us that God created Adam first, mm -hmm. and later he created Eve. And uh, you look at everything that had to happen between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve, and that tells you not only is the seventh day a long period of time, the sixth day must be a long period of time. Because mm. uh, Adam had to work the garden, he had to name all the soulish animals in the garden, Mm. relate to them. The text says that God observed that he was alone. It takes time for a man to feel lonely. Uh, he, God put him to sleep, performed surgery on him. And when Adam saw the newly created Eve, the Hebrew word that's used in the text there is the word hapa'am. Mm -hmm. And it's used more than 20 times in the Old Testament, consistently translated at long last. Mm. Therefore, the sixth day must be a long period of time. And the grammatical structure of Genesis 1 tells us that days 6 and 7 are long periods of time. All the days must be long periods of time. And therefore, there's no conflict between the Bible says about the age of the earth and the universe and what the scientific evidence is telling us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful explanation. But, um, you know, we may have to spend some more time uh, uh, interacting with you to understand it more clearly. Uh, but coming back to the second section of who the creator of that cosmos can be, or uh, why do you think the God of the Bible alone can be the creator of that cosmos? Well, we have clear evidence through the space-time theorems and Big Bang cosmology that there must be a God beyond space and time that created the universe. Mm -hmm. But many religions believe in that kind of a deistic God. But when you look at the characteristics of the universe and the Earth and Earth's light, you realize that this God beyond space and time has very carefully fine-tuned 
or designed the universe, the earth and earth's life, uh, for the entry of human beings. And the degree of fine-tuning that's necessary to make possible the appearance of human beings is far, far beyond anything we humans can match in terms of our own engineering design and inventiveness. In fact, uh, in two of my books, Why the Universe is the Way It Is and The Crater and the Cosmos, I calculate the difference based on just one design feature of the universe, mm -hmm. basically showing that the, the God beyond space and time, at a minimum, must be a trillion, 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 trillion times more intelligent, more knowledgeable, more creative, and powerful than we human beings. And these are characteristics mm -hmm. that only a personal being can manifest. So this establishes theism that we're dealing with a personal God, a God that has the attributes of intelligence, knowledge, power, creativity, and care. Uh, but I argue that based on the science alone, it must be a redeeming God. Because what you see in the fine-tuning, uh, the fine-tuning is most spectacularly displayed in the context of what you need to do to the universe, the earth, and earth's life to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings from their sin and evil in a short period of time. And this is the God of the Bible. That what, that's what isolates the God of the Bible from the gods of all the other religions of the world. So the scientific evidence alone demonstrates that there must be a deistic God who is a theistic God, a personal God, who is also a redeeming God, who has designed everything to make possible billions of human beings coming into relationship with God himself and being delivered permanently from their sin and evil. Well, I'm able to follow, uh, follow uh, the logic that you said about that this God has to be a theistic God, number one. This God has to be a personal God, number two. This God has to be, you know, very intelligent, etc. you know, very powerful, etc., etc. But why this God has to be a redeeming God? That's the that's the kind you know question probably I'm not able to follow when you said if you can please explain a little bit on that. Sure, uh, we actually have um, a compendium on our website reasons.org/fine-tuning, where we show you the scientific evidence of fine-tuning that's necessary to get bacteria existing in the universe for a period of three months or le or three months or more. And then we contrast it with the fine tuning you need for bacteria to exist for three billion years or more. And you see it's exponentially greater required fine tuning. But then we take it up to plants and animals and you get another exponentially increased requirement for fine tuning. Then we take it up to the equivalent of human beings. But where you see the most dramatic increase in the need for fine tuning design is what do you need and not just for humans to exist, but for billions of humans to live at one time, at one place, where they have the civilization and technology, where it's possible to communicate the gospel message of the Bible to billions of human beings, uh, where those billions of human beings can recognize their sinners and come to God uh, to be forgiven of their sins and enter into a permanent relationship with him. That's where you have the greatest necessity of fine-tuning design. And in our latest book we've been publishing at Reasons to Believe, we basically document from the scientific measurement that indeed the universe, Earth, and Earth's life manifests that extremely high degree of fine-tuning design for the specific purpose mm. of making possible the redemption of billions of human beings from their sin and evil. Mm. So, so the redemption part, that's, that's where um, the question still lies. So man, uh, God wanted to, 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 to redeem man from sin and evil. And um, because of that, this fine tuning is, or there is fine tuning. And because of that, man is, um, you know, existing who needs redemption. From what? Because it is the fine tuning of God right. again. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, the Bible tells us that God began his works of redemption before he created anything at all. Mm. In that case, we would expect that God would 
create and design the universe, Earth and Earth's life, to make possible mm. that redemptive plan that he put into effect before he created everything. Mm, mm. And so what I share with a lot of my secular scientist peers is this. Uh -huh. I mean, if you will do your scientific research from a biblical redemptive perspective, it will make you more successful in making scientific discoveries. Mm. For the simple reason, if this God exists, that's exactly what we'd expect mm. uh, when we study the universe, Earth, mm. and Earth's life. And you know, my next book, Design to the Core, I basically make that point, that indeed, no matter where you look in the universe, the largest size scales all the way down to the smallest size scales, we see fine-tuning design for mm. the specific purpose of making possible the redemption of billions of human beings within mm. a short period of time. So, so this trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of powerful person, do you, I mean, Bible says he's one God. So this one God being trillions and trillions and trillions of knowledge, you know, knowledgeable, powerful, and uh, with, with personality or being a person and, you know, all of that, if he chooses to enter into his own creation, um, how, what kind of probability uh, supports that theory? And if he enters into, the, into his own creation, can he still be God? Or does he cease to be God, who is trillions and trillions and trillions of you know, powerful, knowledgeable, etc.? Well, what's interesting is you look at the laws of physics, you can see that they're designed to motivate us human beings to avoid evil and to pursue virtue. I mean, for example, if you to commit evil, uh, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, and gravity are going to operate in such a way that you'll experience more pain, more work, and more wasted time to undo the damage of your sin. So that's a strong motivation from the laws of physics themselves that God had designed to encourage us to avoid evil. But in the process, we discover we don't have the resources to do what we know is right to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but we look at the universe and see, hey, there's a God that created this. This God is extremely powerful, mm -hmm. very knowledgeable, intelligent, and also very caring and loving. Look at everything he's provided for us. And therefore, this God must be willing to do for me what I can't do for myself. Mm. And therefore, I would make sense if this God would reach out and do for me what I'm unable to do for myself, because that's how he designed the universe. Mm. And therefore, it's not a surprise to me that this God that created this incredibly vast universe, complex universe, in his desire to have a relationship with us human beings, came to us in human form, number one, to show us an example of moral perfection. I mean... He declared to a large audience, Jesus of Nazareth, mm. you know, I am morally perfect. Mm. None of you can accuse me of moral imperfection. And his mother and his brothers were in the audience. I mean, you're not going to fool your mother. And so, uh, but in his moral perfection, he decided to pay the redemptive price mm. for all of us who lack moral perfection. I mean, that's a beautiful message of the Bible. Mm. That this God that created this vast universe exquisitely designed it so that we can live and thrive here on planet Earth, came here to planet Earth mm. in human form, showed us an example of perfect moral perfection, but in that moral perfection, decided to pay the mm. redemptive price to redeem us from our sin and evil. Mm. And so he willingly sacrificed himself on the cross. And I argue in my book, Beyond the Cosmos, he wasn't just suffering in our time dimension. He was paying the redemptive price for all the sins committed by every human being uh, since the very first uh, man that he created, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He was only spending six to nine hours on the cross in our time. But this is a God that created all the space-time dimensions of the universe. And I argue that he, because he was fully God, mm. as well as being fully human, he was able to take upon himself uh, the redemptive penalty uh, for all the sins and evils that every human being had ever committed. Mm. And therefore, if we put our faith and trust in him, we indeed can be forgiven of all of our sins, 
of all of our trespasses and evil and enter into an eternal relationship with our Creator. Mm. Well, that's the, that's in fact is the message of Christmas is in John chapter 1 verse 3. It says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And, and when we jump to verse 12, it says, but to all, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when we jump to the further, he says, that word in 14 became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Uh, I guess this is what, I mean, uh, uh, the Christmas messages and that is what you are referring to. However, the question is, you in your explanation about this extremely knowledgeable and extremely powerful God trying to help human beings came down and uh, uh, lived a moral perfect, morally perfect life and you also said he is completely God and he is completely man. How logical is that from your scientific perspective? Can, can that be, uh, is that possible? Well, it's not possible for us, but it's certainly possible for the one that created the universe. I mean, that's what's amazing about the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. The being that created the entire universe and so generously provided uh, for us human beings decided to come here in human form. He came as a baby. He came not only morally perfect, he came in tremendous humility. Mm -hmm. As it tells us in the book of Philippians, he humbled himself and lowered himself and walked among us. So we can actually see who God is, uh, see that it's possible uh, to gain this moral perfection if we put our faith and trust in him. Doesn't that negate his godness in that case? Well, that's why he performed a number of miracles hmm. to show people, hey, I'm more than just a human being. And uh, he purposely performed miracles uh, that the prophets in the Old Testament were unable to perform. Mm. So, for example, he allowed Lazarus to remain dead for four days and four nights before he raised him bodily from the dead. And this is a demonstration, hey, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is not just a human being. Only God can do these kinds of miracles. Mm. And note, too, that Jesus and his ministry would forgive people. And, you know, the message of the Bible is only God can forgive. So he was repeatedly demonstrating to the peoples at that time that he was not just fully human, he was also fully God. If he was fully God, what was the necessity of um, the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, or the Holy Spirit shall overshadow Mary? Um, if he was fully, I mean... He is an extremely powerful and extremely knowledgeable and extremely wonder-working actual creator. Then why, do, why does he, I mean, is there any role of Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary so that he is conceived? Well, you know, the Christian God is a triune God. Mm. It's one essence mm. and three persons. Mm. And, you know, in Christianity, God is not compelled to create. God is in perfect fellowship. Mm. Now you've got the God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in perfect loving fellowship with one another, uh, but they decide to create. Mm. And so creation is not a necessity for the God of the Bible. It's a desire of the God of the Bible. Mm. And what we see in the Gospel or the uh, first epistle of John is that, in fact, if you go to uh, John chapter 1, you quoted that earlier, uh, where it says uh, that, you know, God created everything. But it also says in that same chapter 1 that God's light went out to every human being. Mm. And it's in the first epistle of John that that light is defined. It says God's light is a combination of God's love, God's life, and God's truth. Mm. And we see is that the three members of that one God, that one essence, you have uh, the Son bestowing light, the Father bestowing love, and the Holy Spirit bestowing truth. And so they divide their labor. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And it was the Holy Spirit that placed that seed within Mary uh, that, you know, led to Jesus becoming uh, fully human uh, from her womb. 
And I think it was crucial. God wanted to show human beings, if you want a relationship with me, if you want to be delivered from your sin and evil, you need to humble yourself. That's the message of the book of Job. Uh, Job humbled himself before God as three mm. friends did not. Mm. And so we need to humble ourselves before God. And therefore, I think it's appropriate that uh, Jesus, in becoming fully human, the creator of the universe, becoming fully human, also came to us in the humblest way we can imagine. Mm. He was born into a poor family. Uh, his diapers had to be changed. I mean, he was born as an infant. Uh, so uh, he gave us not only an example of uh, moral perfection, he gave us an example of the humility we need in order to come into relationship uh, with the eternal God. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent explanation for the all-powerful trillions and trillions and trillions of, uh, you know, trillions more powerful than a human being, more intelligent than a human being, and more um, uh, able than a human being, became a human being, and he showed the moral perfection. So that's the message of Christmas, uh, and that's what we are celebrating this month. And we wish uh, all the viewers a, a very, very Merry Christmas and also a Happy New Year. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Ross, the, the uh, string theory is the buzzword these days in India. You know, in the, uh, in the educated communities, in the scientific communities, and in the intellectual communities, that's what uh, they're talking about. What, what is this string uh, theory? And with this string theory, there is, uh, you know, people are discussing or debating that whether it um, challenges the spread of this Christmas message or it enhances, actually, the spread of the Christmas message. What do you think? Yeah, I think it enhances it. And, uh, you know, I had the privilege of uh, being a research fellow at Caltech, and Caltech was the place where string theory was birthed. Uh -huh. I got to know some of the string theorists that uh, developed it. And uh, what they were able to discover at Caltech is that in order to integrate our cosmic creation model with our particle creation model, there had to be extra dimensions of space. Mm. And so, what we recognize is that God created the universe with nine dimensions of space. All those nine dimensions expanded from the cosmic creation event. Mm. But at 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the cosmic creation event, six of those nine dimensions stopped expanding. And so you've got six very tiny space dimensions and three very large ones. But you need those six very tiny space dimensions to explain all the symmetries that we see in gravity, uh, general relativity, and quantum mechanics. And you need all three in order to have life in the universe. Mm. And uh, there simply isn't enough room within the dimensions of length, width, height, and time for all the symmetries required mm. by quantum mechanics, gravity, and general relativity. Mm. That's what the theoretical physicists at Caltech discovered uh, more than 20 years ago. But I want to make it clear Mm -hmm. String theory is not the only particle creation model uh, that requires these extra dimensions of space. And so string theory has got competition. And uh, we're not, we don't yet have the measurements, the experiments, to discern which of these theories is correct. But what they all share in common, they require these extra tiny dimensions of space. Mm. And what that tells us mm. is that the God that created the universe must have the power uh, to create nine dimensions of space that are one dimension at time. And time is that dimension in which cause and effect phenomena can take place, uh, where the effects take place after the causes. And since the universe has a cause, then the one that created the universe, at a bare minimum, must have the power to move and operate and uh, create and design within the equivalent of two time dimensions. So what this demonstrates, we're dealing with a God that's extra dimensional, mm. a God that's got the power to move and operate in a minimum of the equivalent of 11 space-time dimensions. And the space-time theorems tell us uh, that this God is able to create space-time dimensions at will. So he's not subject to these space-time dimensions. What this is doing for us is showing scientifically 
just how extremely powerful this God that created the universe must be. And so I look at string theory and all the other particle creation models that like it mm -hmm. um, tell us that there must be these extra dimensions. It's basically telling us God is way bigger and way powerful than mm -hmm. what human beings have thought about for centuries. And so this is really giving us a new breakthrough in theology is telling us how incredibly powerful uh, this God is. In fact, I wound up writing a book on this. It's called uh, Beyond the Cosmos. Mm. And the longest chapter in the book is a chapter on string theory. And I basically use that to tell people we now have scientific evidence that God is extra dimensional and trans dimensional. And he's extra dimensional and trans dimensional. This is a God that's able to redeem us from our sin and evil. This is a God that is able to predetermine everything from before the universe even existed and at the same time give us human beings uh, the freedom of choice. I mean, one thing I noticed when I looked at the Bible and compared it with the other holy books and religions of the world, mm -hmm. the Bible stands alone in telling us uh, attributes of God uh, that are impossible to visualize or imagine within the dimensions we human beings experience. Uh, but they make perfect sense once we recognize that we're looking at a God that is extra dimensional and trans dimensional. And the fact that this is unique to the Bible was one piece of evidence to me in my late teens. This book is not just written by human beings. Mm -hmm. It contains teachings about God that are impossible for us human beings to visualize or imagine. The message of this book must come from a being that transcends the limitations that we human beings experience. Hmm. So, so on the on like uh, the same extremely powerful, extremely knowledgeable, extremely transdimensional and cross-dimensional attributes of that person, uh, doesn't those qualities or attributes exist in the other deities that the holy books present? Can why can't we? choose one of those, why does it have to be the uh, God of the Bible who chose to enter into universe as a baby? Well, I looked at these other holy books and yes, they talk about, uh, you know, transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about uh, heaven. But as I looked at everything that they wrote, it's something that is possible for a human being to imagine and visualize and write about. Mm. What I saw in the Bible was something distinctly different. I mean, for example, in the non-biblical holy books, God is either described as being one person, uh, you know, one God or multiple gods. What you've got in the Bible is something different. It's one God manifested in three persons, one essence, uh, but three persons. And uh, this triune God is something that can't be visualized mm. within length, width, height, and time. Mm. But it explains why uh, the universe is the way it is. I wrote an article years ago making the point, science only makes sense if God is triune. If mm. God is not one essence, we're going to expect multiple conflicting aspects of creation. But that's not what we see. Everything is harmonious. Everything is clearly manifesting a single plan, a single set of purposes. And so this is... It's the idea that God is one essence, one purpose, one set of attributes, one mind, uh, but manifests in three persons because we see in this creation, we have human beings that are capable of experiencing love. And love can only be created by a being that is actually experiencing love. Hmm. And so it's with the triune God, we've got God in relationship, God in loving relationship with one another through the triune, uh, you know, the fact that we have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, one essence, one purpose, one mind, and fellowship with one another. And therefore, we can understand where love came from. Mm. This is the problem I see uh, with the strictly monotheistic religions uh, like Islam and uh, Judaism, is they really have no answer for the origin of love. Uh, mm. Or you have this God... Uh, creating beings that had something that this God did not have. Mm. And, uh, you know, that violates the principle of cause and effect uh, that the greater cannot come from the lesser. 
So it's really only in Christianity we can make sense of the human character, we can make sense of the universe, and explain why science uh, works the way it does. And it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Christianity, uh, because it's in Reformation Christianity, uh, you know, when we realize that the laws of physics are consistent. Uh, they never change, as it says in Jeremiah 33. Therefore, we can trust our scientific observations and experiments to reveal truth. Hmm. Hmm. So this is, a, this is a very peculiar question from one of our friends. Um, this is how he wrote it. Is it true? I mean, in Indian uh, scientific fraternity, uh, our Indian brothers, uh, uh, you know, who've come from scientific fraternity, they are quoting Erwin Schrodinger, and they say that uh, you also use this word qu quantum mechanics in, in the explanation yes. of the eight or 11 dimensions that God must have. So using this quantum dynamics, uh, I mean, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, they, their claim is if you go that route, the only thing that you get out of this universe is one consciousness, nothing but one consciousness. Do you agree with that? Well, I do agree that the God that created the universe uh, is a single conscious entity. Again, it's three persons and one essence. Uh -huh. And so, yes, in order to explain human consciousness, Mm -hmm. uh, God must be a conscious being himself. Uh, but what I'm seeing coming out of India, and it's not just India, it's coming out of uh, Europe and America too, mm -hmm. are uh, physicists and astronomers speculating uh, that maybe uh, there's an escape from Big Bang cosmology uh, in quantum mechanics. And it's a recognition that if you go back in time, we see that the universe is smaller and smaller, I mean, it affirms a biblical statement that there was a beginning to space, time, matter, and energy. But they make the point that if you go back uh, in the history of the universe, you reach a point where the universe is so small and so incredibly dense that quantum mechanics has the possibility of being stronger in its effects on the dynamics of the universe than gravity and general relativity. Hmm. And so they're speculating that there's these quantum gravity theories that may allow for an escape from the beginning. And perhaps the universe might even be eternal or a more popular idea that the universe goes through these cycles of a contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. And I know this is popular in India because the Hindu Vedas speak about a reincarnating universe, right. a universe that goes through multiple, multiple cycles of birth and rebirth with a period of 4.32 billion years. Hmm. Uh, so people are looking at the quantum gravity era and basically are describing the conditions of the universe when it was less than 10 to the minus 43 seconds old in the context of Big Bang cosmology. And they're basically saying, since our measurements and experiments are not able to determine what's going on in that quantum gravity era, we are free to speculate that perhaps the quantum space-time fluctuations that exist at that time are so extremely large, it would actually allow for a violation of the space-time theorems, and maybe there is no beginning to the universe, or maybe there's a previous episode where the universe uh, was contracting. Which is why in this book, The Crater and the Cosmos, the fourth edition, I actually write about some of the latest astronomical observations that for the first time are penetrating the physics of the quantum gravity era. I mean, if you want an escape uh, from this beginning of the universe, the space-time beginning, you're going to need really large uh, quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we would expect the images of distant quasars and blazars at short wavelengths uh, to, as they travel from that distant quasar and blazar, those quantum space-time fluctuations that existed in the extremely early history of the universe uh, will be magnified. And we would expect those images to be blurred. But when we look at those images, they're not blurred. They're sharp. And the, the fact that we see no blurring tells us there's a limit 
on the size of the quantum space-time fluctuations. Hmm. And it's such that uh, we got every reason to believe uh, that the space-time theorems hold all the way through the quantum gravity era, and therefore the universe really does have a beginning uh, just uh, 13.8 billion years ago. Hmm. And there is physicists in Britain who also make the point, if you speculate a previous era of the universe contracting and then joining to the present expanding universe, you've got the problem of joining the geometry of a collapsing universe to the geometry of an expanding universe. And it's the same problem you face in trying to conceive of a wormhole where you can travel from one space-time realm to another space-time realm by having the singularities that two black holes perfectly touch one another and remain stable. Mathematically, this is a conceivable idea, but mm. it's physically impossible. The probability of those two singularities perfectly touching one another is zero. The probability that they remain stable for more than a fraction of a second is also zero. You've got the same problem in trying to join the geometry of a collapsing universe to the geometry of an expanding universe. Mathematically, it's conceivable, but physically, it's an impossibility. It, mm -hmm. it will not happen. And therefore, we really do have a beginning to the universe mm -hmm. that occurred uh, just 13.8 billion years ago, mm -hmm. a beginning that requires a being more powerful than the universe mm -hmm. that's capable of creating uh, space-time dimensions at will. Having just consciousness and then taking, you know, a reincarnation is something that you are uh, not supporting. But the incarnation of this powerful being is what you are, uh, you know, you're proposing, which is which is what Christmas is. So, any last words as Christmas greetings to our audience, Dr. Ross? Well, I would encourage people to actually read and study. Uh, what the Bible's got to say about this God. Now, look at the science. I mean, I think what's beautiful about uh, the Bible, it tells us God gave us two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And so the passion of us at Reasons to Believe is to show through the science of the book of nature uh, that the book of scripture indeed uh, is the inspired in air word of God. It's a message we can trust. It's a message that tells us that the God that created the universe came to planet Earth in human form. And we put our faith and trust in what he did for us when he was here on planet Earth 2,000 years ago. We can be permanently delivered from our sin and evil. And more than that, uh, we can, in addition to being delivered from our sin and evil, we can experience an enhanced capability of expressing and receiving love from one another and from God for the rest of eternity. Well, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's an honor to interview you, and uh, it's an honor um, for Rakshana Television as well to host you and present you to uh, the Indian crowd. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and showing up um, on the show. Dr. Ross, uh, we wish you and your family a Merry Christmas as well. Well, thank you very much, and a Merry Christmas to all of you. Well, thank you so much. Let, uh, let me summarize this in Telugu and then we'll call it uh, call it the day. Kanuvipu and a Karakurum Lo, Iroju Mananjushna twenty, Dr. Ras Garato, Mananjeshna, he interviewed Lo. Christmas, Anadi, Lekpate, he devudu, powerful gown twenty devudu, Chala Gopa devudu, he Prapanchan is Rustin China devudu. Ipudu, Manamajakuchina Baluduga Ravataniki, science kuda opukuntundi, ala uchinduku. Avakasha Lunai, Ainaku, Ainaku, Adi Sathya Padutundi, and to work a scientist, Propancha Prakati Ganshina twenty, scientist governor, Dr. Rasgar Chaptonaru, uh, Alanti Confidence, Manakamana Prabhu, Wakim Dwara, uh, Aina Icharani, Gen um, Adi Kandamu, Hebril Kras in a Patrika, Timothy, Titu Kras in a Patrika, Yirmi Amari, Romil Kras in a twenty Patrika Lonunchi, Aina, uh, Chepe Praitan Chesaru. Um, Mirandru Kuda, you program Dwara, English Lavuna Patikini, Miru Dani Santoshistu, Dan Lonatun, Samachar and Tiskuntra and Namutunan. Until we meet uh, once again on uh, the eye opener, uh, keep, uh, keep praying about Rakshana Television and continue to uphold us in your prayers and keep supporting us um, with your valuable prayers and well wishes. And uh, I wish all of you, the audiences, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much.